we saw that uh, when you transmit data over a channel, because uh, mostly due to band limiting nature, usually low pass nature of the channel, you will have intersymbol interference. The uh, if you send a pulse that is confined to one symbol interval, it will get spread out over many intervals and uh, the received value at any instant will be the result of uh, some weighted summation of many symbols. Okay. Now, if it is spread out too much, what happens is that the effect of the interfering bits can be comparable or even more than the bit that you want to receive. So, in that case, you really cannot receive the data with a small enough bit error rate. Okay. And one way to characterize this is by plotting the eye diagram, which is a plot of overlapped intervals with uh, random data. Okay. So, the opening in the middle tells you how much uh, margin you have for uh, receiving the data and the opening could well be 0 in a uh, sufficiently challenging channel. Okay. This means that if you think of the discrete time equivalent pulse response, the absolute sum of the remaining uh, elements, I mean other than the cursor could be equal to or more than the cursor that is possible. right? Like for instance, if I have, if uh, the pulse response is let us say 0 0.25, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, the sum of these is more than the cursor and if those happen to be with a negative sign, then that will completely uh, turn the symbol into, I mean turn the polarity into the opposite one. Okay. So, that is possible and even if the eye is not completely closed, if the opening is very small, you really cannot uh, recover the data reliably because there will always be some error in the timing. You cannot put the clock right in the middle of the eye and there will always be some error in the threshold voltage as well and there will be noise because of that you will get too much better rate. So, we have to do something about it. Okay. So, what is it that uh, we can do? We can think of this problem both in the time and the frequency domains. So, the channel response uh, at DC I will take it as 0 dB because the wires are short and then it can do anything, it could have notches and what not. Okay. Or in the time domain, the pulse response could be something like that. I have removed the delay part of it, I am showing only this and if you take uh, discrete samples, they could look like that. Okay. Whereas, ideally what we would have wanted to receive would be a rectangular pulse. Of course, we cannot do this because a rectangular pulse like this has an infinite bandwidth. Okay. So, but even if you do not receive this, but receive a finite bandwidth pulse like that, that is okay. It does not, I mean, as long as it does not interfere with the neighboring bits, that is fine. So, basically, this is what we would like to. If it is band limited, it's lo it looks like that. Okay. Now, the question is what is it that we are supposed to do? Okay, the channel frequency response is like this and let us say on this I will mark the, so here I have marked the symbol intervals, right? this is T naught. Similarly, here I will mark half the data rate. Like I said, one of the proxies for whether the channel is working well is to think of what happens to alternating data, which has frequency of half the data rate. F naught by 2 and it has some attenuation. Okay. So, how do we go from here to a more open eye, basically to receive a pulse that looks more like what we want to receive. Okay. So, ideally <coughs> what we should receive is, uh, so let me redraw this. So, this of course, this would be great if uh, we got this. I will show the cursor in the same position here. 
this we won't get but even if we get this this is fine right uh, because if you look at it this doesn't have any inter symbol interference right okay so within one uh, bit interval on either side if the pulse response falls off to zero then you don't have any inter symbol interference okay so how do we go from reality to whatever is ideal again here also maybe i'll mark the ideal the ideal channel would be of course that where there is no attenuation at all but actually we can settle for an ideal channel which uh, i'll define it more precisely but like i said the earlier i said that if you have 75% of uh, the data rate as bandwidth you will largely have an undistorted pulse so i'll show something like this even if it has to be low pass if it is like that it's fine so how do we go from what we have to what we want what should we do you can think about that either in the time domain or the frequency domain ah yeah so yeah basically if you think of it in the frequency domain you should have a high frequency boost okay because we have a low pass type response here and if you multiply it with something like that right the product of these two will give you something like a constant okay the same thing can be thought of in the time domain also you have to convolve this uh, p of t with some other uh, i mean maybe uh, i had called this g of n with you have to convolve it with some f of n so that g convolved with f gives you the ideal impulse it's the same thing i mean the same thing stated in the time domain that's all okay this is fine so essentially this uh, business of equalization is to uh, somehow correct for the low pass channel so that we get uh, less inter symbol interference we probably cannot reduce the inter symbol interference to zero but we also know that we don't have to reduce it to zero we can tolerate some amount of inter symbol interference right because the worst case value that we get will be g of zero minus the absolute sum of the rest of the isi elements now if that value is large enough even if not equal to g of 0 it is okay right <coughs> so how do we do this i mean it turns out essentially uh, because most channels happen to be low pass in fact all channels are low pass uh, the equalizer will have a high pass characteristic okay so and in uh, implementing this we will encounter some limitations which we'll see what we do now we have the transmitter the channel the receiver when i say receiver i refer to the linear blocks of the receiver and finally we have the decision block which takes a decision on what the symbol is either plus 1 or minus 1 now anything you do has to be done before you take the decision obviously because once you take a decision on whether it's plus 1 or minus 1 then all the information is lost and you can't correct it now all this uh, this equalizer business can be placed anywhere here okay that is you can have it in the transmitter
or the receiver and these have certain advantages and disadvantages that we will see ok. And also you can implement these either in continuous time or in discrete time that is you can use a continuous time equalizer or a discrete time equalizer ok. Again they will come with their own advantages and disadvantages ok. But I think it is pretty obvious that if you use a high pass filter that will undo the effect of low pass response essentially you have to boost up the gain, but that itself creates some problems as we will see ok. Because in the end it turns out that with purely linear equalizers of the type I am considering here I am considering filter. So, that means I am thinking of linear time invariant networks. So, you can only do so much and we will have to do something nonlinear as well and that is very frequently done also is this ok. So, just as a quick example let me take some case where g of n is sorry I will represent this in the z domain ok. So, this basically says that g of n is uh, 1 and the second one is a that is all right this the impulse response the pulse response ok. What does the uh, frequency response of this look like remember this is not the frequency response of the channel this is the response corresponding to the discrete time the sampled pulse response ok, but what does that look like. low pass. So, what will be the DC gain? In this case the DC gain is 1 plus a and of course, this is a discrete time system. So, the frequencies go up to half of f naught. What is the gain at f naught by 2? 1 minus a ok, because uh, z is minus 1 right. So, like I said if you have a low pass response the interstimul interference will also be positive ok, the ISI will also be positive. This is in general true of low pass, low pass means things cannot change quickly. So, if you put in a positive pulse it becomes positive and then very slowly dies out. Of course, I mean because of uh, the details of the response there could be like some small ringing and so on. This is opposite to the high pass response, high pass response will go rapidly to the opposite sign and then come back. I mean if A were negative this would become a high pass response right. Now, what is the response that will? So, let us say I use a discrete time I use a discrete time equalizer ok. what is f of z that will equalize g of z? The inverse of that that is all ok. If f of z equals 1 by g of z or 1 over 1 plus a z inverse it will exactly equalize it right. The uh, impulse response of the cascade of these two will be just an impulse and no interstimul interference at all ok. Similarly, if you have if the channel response is some h of f and if you cascade it with some uh, filter whose response is 1 over h of f you will get 1 ok. So, this will also perfectly equalize that is that fine. So, that seems like very simple right all we have to do is measure the response and take the inverse and make the filter. What problems do you foresee here? Huh? 
band limiting is not happening but uh, that's okay let's leave that for now what is the concern with band limiting i have a continuous time filter which in cascade with the channel will give you one that is it is exactly like a wire connecting the transmitter and receiver that seems ideal if you want band limiting you can put it afterwards but anyway what is the why would you want band limiting or in the discrete time stuff what do you is there any problem that you foresee huh? okay so it will be infinite i mean in the case that i have taken 1 plus ac inverse is finite impulse response and 1 over that is infinite impulse response okay so what's the issue there no no you don't have to wait i mean it just the cascade of these two will give you and there's no problem with the definition of the equalizer it will be that it will its impulse response what will this look like 1 plus ac inverse 1 plus az inverse is like that what is the inverse of that what does that look like yeah so it is basically 1 and then the next one will be you can just expand this as uh, I am assuming a is smaller than 1 otherwise this will diverge off but so minus a plus a square minus a cube and so on okay so this i am just expanding it as and so on okay so yeah the cascade of these two will just give you one and all zeros okay so the problem is that again we are talking about really high speed circuits how do you realize a realize an ir filter what kind of structure will you have you'll have a feedback structure right you have to so that means that uh, you have to close the feedback loop at very high speeds this is very difficult to do okay so generally you don't do that so one is the the, <coughs> the problem is Now, this is not we do not have to like I said we do not have to actually uh, realize an exact inverse some approximate stuff will still be ok as long as it reduces the ISI to a manageable level we do not have to reduce ISI to 0. But anyway I am just uh, showing you why the simple thing of simply inverting is not possible. Similarly the same with continuous time. So, first of all this could have notches in which case you cannot even realize the inverse because the way I have written it you need uh, uh, you need an infinite gain here ok. So, that kind of thing anyway is not possible. So, here also you may not have to realize the inverse over all frequencies, but only over a certain band of frequencies ok. Uh, so, here also exact inverse may not be realizable at all because of notches ok you cannot realize infinite gain. Now, even without notches what will happen is that uh, this the channel response is some pretty complicated stuff ok to realize the inverse of that exact inverse of that you may need a very high order filter that also is very difficult at high frequencies ok. So, even if uh, I mean even if you exclude this business of notches which simply even uh, theoretically you cannot do. Uh, even without notches you cannot uh, realize the inverse because the shape is very complicated and you may not be able to exactly uh, invert it or if you do you will need a very high order filter which is not realizable at high frequencies is this ok. So, <coughs> uh, 
So, here Even approximate inverse may be difficult, I mean even uh, the approximate inverse may become difficult at high speeds that is you cannot realize the inverse very well. Okay. So, what the result of all this is that we will use continuous time equalizers, but that equalizer transfer function tends to be simple okay. uh, begin mainly because of speed limitation right. At lower speeds perhaps you could uh, uh, realize a more complicated filter continuous time filter also, but it is not necessary because at low speeds you either do not need it or you can realize everything digitally. Okay. Uh, so, continuous time uh, equalizer tends to be very crude and it will give you some high frequency boost basically that is what you need from the equalizer okay. and that may be sufficient in some cases, but they do have some advantages as I will outline later. Uh, discrete time equalizers you cannot realize IIR equalizers. So, they tend to be FIR that may still be ok. Typically, the transfer function of continuous time equalizers tends to be of the form of you could have more poles, but if you have a 0, you will have at least one pole. Okay. What will, will the frequency response of this look like or with omega? First of all, for this to be an equalizer, what is the condition you need to have? 0 must come before the pole, so that because of the 0, you start getting some high frequency boost and then the pole will eventually limit it. Okay. So, you will have a 0 somewhere, and a pole somewhere and you will have something like that. If you plot it in the Bode plot sense, this is how it will be. So, if this is 1, this gain will be p 1 by z 1. Okay. Now, you somehow choose this z 1, so that at half the data rate at f naught by 2, you get a certain boost. Okay. If you had only continuous time equalization, you for whatever reason you were not able to implement anything else then you would try to adjust the 0 and the rest of the poles. So, that at f naught by 2 you get a boost equal to this attenuation right? or may be not exactly equal, but something close to that. So, that this will get lifted up to nearly 1. Okay. So, early equalizers were like this and this itself may do the job in some cases right? and you can have extra poles you will frequently have it because even if you do not want it every amplifier stage itself is a low pass filter. So, you are going to have this anyway. So, in reality it will look like this and then eventually go down. Okay. Now, let us say that uh, we instead do it in the discrete time domain. Okay. So, we have I will take my particular example. Okay. So, now uh, what I want to know is I already said that the exact inverse which is an IR filter cannot be realized. So, what is an FIR filter that will equalize this? Let us take a guess equalize this meaning we know that it is not going to happen exactly you are not going to get the product of this and some FIR filter to be 1 
for sure, right? But what is it that will at least reduce the ISI? I mean, based on the the exact IIR stuff was one by one plus A Z inverse, which is equal to one minus A Z inverse plus A square Z inverse square, and so on. Okay. So, looking at this, can you tell me an approximate FIR filter which will do the job? One minus A Z inverse. Okay. So, basically. And what will be the cascade of these two? Yeah, so this will be one minus a square. Okay, so there is intersymbol interference, but originally that interfering element was a, and now it is a square. And if a is smaller than one, we have at least done so the job partially, right? We have reduced the ISI. Okay, and if you want a better one, what do you use? Maybe you can also add the second term. So, if you do this, what is it that you get? What do you get? What is the cascade of G of Z and F of Z? If you choose this F of Z. Yeah, so there will be there is no z square, I think z square stuff will cancel out and you will be left with 1 plus a cube at 1. Okay. So, it will just keep getting pushed out. So, if you take this uh, series, right, this uh, the series expansion of 1 over 1 plus a z inverse, add more and more terms, what happens is you will get more and more zeros and 1 intersymbol interference element and that will keep getting pushed out and it will also get smaller in amplitude as long as a is smaller than 1. Okay. So, you can use any of these FIR equalizers and do the job approximately. Now, uh, in addition to what I am saying now, one of the things that I did not emphasize too much is that it is not as though we have a fixed channel, we do not make a chip for like a 40 inch channel and another one for 30 inches and things like that. Okay. So, the same chip has to work for various channels that may be short, that may be long, that may be on the top layer, that may be on the bottom layer and so on. So, eventually these uh, uh, equalizers that you make should be programmable, so that you can adjust them for different channels or maybe even adaptive, adaptive meaning uh, the circuit itself there is there is something in the receiver circuitry that will look at the quality of the received eye in some way and then adjust the coefficients of the filter, whether it is uh, continuous time, discrete time, analog, digital, whatever. So, that you get good equalization. Okay. So, that also has to be there, that we will come to later. First, let us look at what possibilities there are for equalization. Okay. So, but that adaptation is a concern that is, uh, I mean at a high level, I will come to that uh, details later. So, like I said, you can implement the equalizer in the transmitter or in the receiver. Now, which one would be easy for adaptation? in the receiver, because you are measuring how the signal is in the receiver, it is easy to change things in the receiver. Otherwise, you have to somehow get that information back to the transmitter and change things in the transmitter, that is lot more difficult. Okay. So, that also introduces some trade offs. So, anyway, just to quickly, so if I <coughs> if I look at the frequency response of 1 minus A z inverse, what will that look like? It starts from 1 minus A and goes something like that. Okay. So, it is inverting this, right? it is providing high frequency boost. Now, I assumed 1 to be the main tap, there. like every tap can be scaled, that does not change the frequency response, that only changes the gain. Okay. Is this fine? Now, let us look, uh, I mean I will come to the implementations of equalizers later, but let us look at some more limitations that we will encounter. So, let us say like one way or the other either using discrete time or continuous time, we are able to realize a high pass response that will sufficiently equalize our channel. That is 
the product of all these things you do it in the discrete time continuous time everything the product of all these things should look more or less like 1 all the way out to f naught by 2 let's say if we do that it's actually very well equalized right the one thing we have ignored is the phase response so let's assume that it's not so wild that uh, it doesn't distort the ion so on okay but even if you are able to do this there is a problem okay because as attenuation goes on increasing there will be another problem that we'll see so we have the transmitter the channel and the receiver okay it's not as though we'll have only one of them we'll have many and typically each ic many of the serial link ic's also consists of multi channel transceivers okay So, this is 1, this is 2 and there can be many more and on a PCB on a chip these transmitters may be next to each other, these receivers will be next to each other and on the board these two transmission lines will be next to each other and like I said it may not be on a single board, it can be like a small board which is plugged into a big board. I mean if you look at the motherboard of a PC you have a number of things connected right into the PCI slots and so on. So, the connectors also connector pins will be next to each other. So, what happens is that there will be some coupling okay, in various parts. So, this can be on chip on the board or on the connector and so on okay and by the way it is also not uh, one directional like this we have transceivers. So, maybe the other one is in this direction because we always have bi directional communication okay and in serial links it is typically on different channels okay on the phone line you go both ways on the same pair of wires whereas here uh, you go typically on different uh, wires okay and there will be some coupling between these actually this is bidirectional So, what is the result now? What is the effect of this? So, the uh, transmitted signal from 1 will go into 2 and so on. Okay, This is a problem. So, we have the channel response. So, let us say I call it uh, H C H. Now, this transmitter will get coupled through various paths and if you measure the transfer function from this and that it will not be 0 you would have liked it to be 0, but it would not be 0 okay. and even worse a transmitter from this side can also couple to this receiver. Okay. Now, these things are known as cross talk okay. this is the desired response and what I have shown now in red are the cross talk okay. and for obvious reasons this is known as a far end cross talk that is a transmitter here is coupling to the receiver at the other end of the channel and this is known as near end. cross talk okay is this fine 
So, which do you think is worse? I mean, which one will have more dangerous effect? Near end crosstalk, near end crosstalk, because essentially the point is that the signal transmitted from this side by the time it gets here, it is getting weaker and weaker. But the transmitter here is at the full strength, the signal here is at the full strength. If it couples here, you get a uh, very bad effect, but both of them can have a can have an effect. Okay. So, this is abbreviated to fixed and this is abbreviated to next. Okay. So, this crosstalk also has to be taken care of, right. Now, there are various ways to do this. If you know the, so these also can be described by some transfer functions, right. The transfer function from this transmitter to this receiver here, let me say that that is H fixed and the tra transfer function from this transmitter to this receiver over there, let me call it H next. Okay. So, they will be characterized by some transfer functions. How would you fix the situation? What will you do? Or what could you do? I mean, any anything is okay, any solution. Inverse of the model, where? Yeah, not the inverse, you have to subtract it out, right. Basically, let us say, now this is not easy, but at least it may be possible for this, right, because presumably, if this transmitter and this receiver are on the same chip, you know what you are sending out. And if you know the near end crosstalk transfer function, you create another filter inside the chip with the same transfer function and then cancel it off from the incoming signal. Okay. So, this is how these hybrids work in a telephone also even in the old analog telephone, you do not hear yourself speak or maybe you hear a little bit otherwise it will feel weird. Uh, uh, what you do is you there is something called a hybrid that uh, cancels off the outgoing signal and you hear only the incoming voice. Okay. So, that could potentially be done but estimating this uh, transfer function is quite uh, complicated. Okay. In some cases it is done, right. The far end stuff is more difficult because now we do not even know what signal is being sent from there, right, because it is on a different chip altogether. So, to cancel that is uh, uh, seems more difficult, okay. But before that let us also look at what effect this has, okay. So, let me uh, this is the axis, right. What do you think the transfer functions will look like? The crosstalk transfer functions, what will they look like? What kind of shape will they have? Some for a small fraction of the original, basically it will be the same as the channel response, but scaled down. No, I mean think of the scenario, you have a wire here, you have another wire there and you are talking about the coupling between the two wires. So, what kind of transfer function will you have? Huh? Uh, no, transfer function what uh, what type of. Uh, so, the channel itself is low pass right. So, what do you expect this to be? Huh? Low pass why? What will be the coupling at DC? If you have a wire here and a wire there, what will be the coupling at DC? There is no coupling right, there is not connected to each other. So, it is capacitive coupling. So, it will be some sort of high pass of course, eventually everything will die out. So, the response will uh, the crosstalk response tends to look like this, it will there will be nothing at uh, low frequencies and then it will peak somewhere and then it will eventually die out. Okay. In fact, it is bad in a way, the desired one it is high frequencies are getting attenuated, the undesired one it is worst at high frequencies. So, it could be that with a 
particular combination of parameters crosstalk the effect of crosstalk can be very bad okay now how do you judge whether this crosstalk uh, will bother you or not i mean think of the eye diagram type uh, analysis we did we discussed yesterday forget the ber average ber and so on let's say you simulate the eye diagrams so now what simulation will you carry out and how will you conclude whether crosstalk is too bad i mean bad enough to kill your uh, transmission or it's okay Yeah, one uh, again a sort of shortcut is to look at uh, what happens at half the data rate. Okay. <coughs> you look at the magnitude at f not by 2. So, if you are sending alternating data on both channels, the magnitude response of the channel at f not by 2 will tell you how much of the desired signal you get. The magnitude of the crosstalk transfer function at f not by 2 will tell you how much crosstalk signal you get. Okay, maybe you can judge something from there. So, better thing is to look at the eye diagrams also. Okay. So, again let us consider a first order type of crosstalk response that is So, let us say the crosstalk uh, frequency response is like this, it will never be this simple, but I am just saying it is like this. And if the other transmitter, the one that is crosstalking, is sending data like this, what do you expect at the receiver? What do you expect as the output of the crosstalk? This is the input to the transfer function, what will be the output? In this case, you will get uh, basically this exponential. Anytime you have a bit transition, you have a pulse. Okay. Now, uh, in general, the response won't be simple like this. So, what will happen is you will get a more smoothed out pulse, which also goes to zero because the DC gain of the crosstalk channel is zero. You will get something like that. Now, you can plot the eye diagram of this also, right. The only significance is you have to look at the peak to peak value of this. Okay. Now, the peak interference from the crosstalk equals that much. Okay. So, in the worst case, this can be subtracted from the signal amplitude. Okay. So, uh, first of all, because of ISI, you have reduction in the signal amplitude, and the worst case reduction is the sum of absolute sum of uh, the intersimple interference elements. To that, you also have to add the crosstalk. Okay, it is possible that the crosstalk response will peak there because you can't tell, right? It can peak anywhere, but you can't tell. First of all, if it is from the far end, uh, crosstalk like this, okay, or from the near end. Uh, so, let us say uh, if you consider near end crosstalk, these two could be at even slightly different frequencies. Okay. What happens if you plot an eye diagram of a data stream, right? Uh, not at an integer multiple of uh, a period and not with the width equal to integer multiple, but with a slightly different period. What happens? the whole thing will be smeared out right it will look like just a splash of paint because now there is no timing because if uh, the frequencies are slightly different the timing could be anywhere you could start from uh, the edge of the clock and then you keep moving so the whole thing will be smeared out 
So, that will happen for the near end crosstalk also, because the near end crosstalk and the far end desired channel are at different frequencies usually. So, if you plot the eye diagram of the data and crosstalk with the same period, the crosstalk will look like it is completely smeared out. So, it is easy to see that a peak can coincide with the sampling instant that you have. Okay. So, essentially what you can do is you, however you do it, uh, one of the ways to do it is you look at the crosstalk frequency response and you plot the eye diagram corresponding to that or basically you simulate it with uh, random data, you will get some peak value. So, the worst case reduction in signal amplitude is equal to that peak value. So, now you can judge if your signal amplitude is let us say 500 millivolts and the peak of the crosstalk is 50 millivolts, then you will come down to a worst case of 450. So, maybe that is good enough. But if your signal amplitude is 200 millivolts and the crosstalk uh, peak amplitude is also 200 millivolts, you could actually kill the signal all the way to 0. So, based on that you have to see whether crosstalk is a significant factor in your particular case or not. Is this clear? No, the period will change because this transmitter here and that transmitter there are transmitting at different frequencies. Okay. So, that means that the peaks due to this transmitter, the timing of the peaks due to this transmitter compared to the received data here will slide over time. Okay. Anyway, first of all there is no uh, certainty in timing because the delay of the crosstalk channel and this are quite different, they can be uh, very different. Okay. So, that is there and uh, because of that of course, it can anyway coincide with the peak and if the frequencies are different every once in a while it is guaranteed to coincide with the uh, center of the eye. Is this okay? So, you have to look at the peak of the crosstalk and judge, right. Then, <coughs> what we have to do is also to see how equalization will affect crosstalk. What is equalization doing to crosstalk? It is making it worse, right, because uh, the crosstalk itself is a high frequency phenomenon, it is like a high pass thing, and equalization will make it worse. In fact, we will see that because of this reason, if crosstalk is limiting you, actually increasing the equalization does not help. Okay. If it was only the channel, perhaps uh, like I made a relatively poor crude equalizer and you make a better equalizer and it will help the data transmission. But if you have crosstalk also, in your case, you will get a better signal, but also more crosstalk. So, it may not help at all. right? So, because of this reason, so, this linear equalization will help only to a certain extent and we have to go to one particular technique which is non-linear equalization, okay, which is also very widely used. Okay. So, we will discuss that in the next class. Is this fine? So, these are basics of equalization. The kind of equalizers you can make on uh, uh, very high speed channels are simple. As the speed reduces, you can make more and more complicated equalizers. What happens is as usual these days, as the uh, speed reduces from the maximum possible in a given technology. Uh, today, maybe if you come to let us say gigabits per second, then the standard thing is you have some initial analog uh, amplifiers, after that you have an A to D converter and do everything in the digital domain. Okay. Once you go into the digital domain, it is in principle possible to realize very complicated uh, signal processing functions. Of course, you may still not be able to do it because the size of the digital circuit is too much or the area, I mean the power dissipation becomes too much and so on, but it is done. Okay. Like for instance, in the Ethernet case, which is very complicated because it has uh, uh, four pairs of uh, wires all twisted together. I mean, that is the Ethernet cable that you see, and it can be very long. So, that means that everything is coupling to everything else also. They do take some steps to make sure it does not couple, but still, I mean, after all, you cannot isolate two things perfectly. So, there you have this uh, digitization and equalization in the digital domain. So, both the channel equalization and there you cannot just uh, estimate the crosstalk and let it be, the crosstalk is huge. Okay. So, in fact, there is a filter like uh, you, he suggested earlier, you can estimate the crosstalk transfer function and subtract it off. So, that itself is a very long filter, hundreds of taps. So, that is used to cancel everything. Okay. So, that is done, but if you are doing at uh, an even higher speed, you have to do things more in the analog way. Okay or even if you do it in a digital way, the speed is very high. So, what the, the functions that you can implement are somewhat simpler. Okay. But one of the trends these days is to go towards ADC based receivers. That is, you have an A to D converter, you have some equalization in the analog domain, but you have an A to D converter and you do everything after the A to D conversion. Okay. 
okay if we have time we'll also discuss that in some detail okay